uh, she'll be talking to us about the regulatory foundations of international professional groups. I saw that three months ago, uh, although I understand we're going to get an even better version today. <laughs> Oh, any more of your time, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Paul, and thanks very much, uh, uh, Jag and the National Institute for having me here today. Um, it's uh, it's good to be in a workshop. I haven't been for uh, for a long time, and even better um, uh, for my session being chaired by Paul whose auctions are studied uh, and then implemented as part of, uh, of, uh, of the Bank uh, of England. So um, work that uh, we did in the GFC. So um, what I am going to say uh, today is very much, I have said before basically, but um, and in that speech that um, uh, the bank published in uh, February, but what I've done here is I've uh, tried to update it for some sort of developments that uh, have happened. So it's up to date. And um, I have tried to make it a little bit more relevant for the type of audience uh, that uh, uh, we have here, which indeed is the type of audience I really want to engage in this uh, uh, debate. So, uh, the reason I want uh, to engage um, um, economists, uh, academics, thinkers uh, in this is because our Parliament is currently debating a financial services and markets bill um, that redefines the prudential regulation authorities, the PRAs, powers and responsibilities. The bill would give the PRA a new objective to act when we can to facilitate the UK economy's international competitiveness and its growth over the medium to long term, subject to alignment with international standards. The new objective, importantly, is secondary to the PRA's primary objective, which was set in the aftermath of the global financial crisis and remains the same. It's to advance the safety and soundness of banks and insurers and to protect insurance policy holders because we regulate both uh, deposit takers and insurance companies. The secondary nature of the international competitiveness and growth objective, therefore, means that the BRA cannot pursue it if it's in conflict with safety and soundness. But it does mean that amongst policy options that advance safety and soundness, the PRA should seek to pursue those that also facilitate international competitiveness and growth. Now, there has been an active debate in Parliament about the status of the competitiveness and growth objective on the approach the PRA would take in pursuing it and on how to measure the PRA's performance against it. As part of this debate, the PRA has welcomed the bill as it stands, including the new objective, and has released public documents setting out proposals on how it will approach its new responsibilities. Against this backdrop, I, th I think you can see that it is vital that we, as the PRA, have a good understanding of the links between finance and economic growth, what these have to do with international competitiveness, what on earth international competitive means, and how prudential regulation of the banking and insurance sector can affect those things. As we approach these questions, we can draw on a large body of existing research on how finance contributes to, or indeed detracts from, broad economic growth. This has clearly got to be a foundation for how we approach our new objective. Now, uh, in what I will say in the rest of uh, the speech, I will uh, try to summarize uh, my existing understanding of the insights from the literature. And I look forward to learning more from this workshop and other contributions. Indeed, I know that a paper before lunch uh, looked at some uh, of the propositions uh, from the literature empirically. 
Now, the first link between finance and growth that research appears unambiguous on it is that the financial sector can affect economic activity through the frequency, duration, scale, and nature of financial crises. Crises, especially when preceded by credit expansion, have been shown to be associated with deep recessions, slow recoveries, and permanent reductions in economic activity. Given the large size of the financial sector relative to the rest of the UK economy, financial crisis can have a particularly severe impact in the, in, in the UK or economies like the UK. Although higher bank capital may not always reduce the probability of a crisis, it is clear that it lowers the cost of a crisis by sustaining the provision of financial services, especially bank lending during the resulting recession. In contrast, in normal times, that is to say at least five years apart from banking crisis events, bank capital does not seem to be negatively correlated with loan, loan growth or GDP growth. Research also suggests that while in the short term an increase in capital requirements may temporarily reduce credit provision, there's no such discernible effect in the long term. So that's the first link where I think the research findings are pretty consistent amongst each other. The second link, I think, uh, the BRA needs to be alert to between finance and growth is the extent to which better functioning financial systems foster growth by improving resource allocation and technological change. This is especially important for new and small firms and sectors that are more reliant on intangible assets and are research knowledge intensive. In this respect, there's plenty of evidence that improved competition among banks is positive for new business formation and the expansion of small firms, which in turn is an important driver of broad-based innovation and productivity improvements. However, some literature seems to also find that excessively large financial centers can slow down growth. Broadly speaking, once the level of private credit reaches a high level as a percentage of GDP, the positive effect of finance on growth can dissipate, according to these papers. <clears throat> this could be because of a trade-off between growth and fragility due to excessive risk-taking, especially when the main driver of credit expansion is through assets that are less conducive to economic growth, such as uh, uh, household mortgage financing for existing uh, stock of houses, rather than, say, lending to innovative businesses or to finance infrastructure. But the results of this strand of the literature are subject to dispute, so I'm only mentioning them for completeness. Finally, um, the financial services sector can also directly increase economic activity by exporting financial services abroad and attracting foreign capital to be invested in the UK. The provision of international financial services has historically concentrated in a few global hubs due to agglomeration forces, the success of which appears to be a consequence of many factors to the extent that we understand it, such as a trusted legal system, <coughs> a competitive tax structure, reliable infrastructure, the self-reinforcing benefits that arise when a skilled workforce and large number of firms converge in one jurisdiction and even a convenient time zone and a predictable and stable political and regulatory framework. <coughs> Although the PRA has, def has a definitely a role to play in, in providing, for example, predictability and st stability in the prudential regulatory framework, it has limited influence on some of the other factors. Uh, this question, that the question therefore remains, how can the PRA translate these broad insights from the literature of finance and growth into something that can guide practically our prudential regulatory activities in line with our new secondary objective? One challenge we face when we try to do that is that in contrast to the wide literature on the impact of finance on economic prosperity, there is much less research that can help us understand the specific contribution of financial regulation to growth 
through the channel of international competitiveness of the financial services sector. This is partly because international competitiveness is a complicated economic concept which doesn't have a uniformly accepted definition. At the most aggregate level, it can refer to the entire macroeconomy. For example, the competitiveness of the UK economy relative to the French economy. This view of competitiveness is based on the notion that a, uh, that a fight for the global market share is a zero sum game, and it has been criticized, including by uh, Krugman, um, who has claimed that the country's per capita GDP growth is almost entirely dominated by the absolute growth rate of domestic productivity and not the productivity of certain domestic industries relative to that to those in other countries. There is a business literature also on international competitiveness that has uh, tried to explore the meaning. The two views, the resource-based view focuses on how competitive advantage is derived from using resources efficiently and is closely associated with the concept of productivity. Um, according to the resource view, all countries can become more competitive at the same time, and this is more aligned to Krugman's uh, position. By contrast, the market-based view uh, of the business literature focuses on how competitive advantage is derived from environmental factors and the positioning of competitors within a market structure. This is more aligned with, let's say, the popular view of competitiveness as a zero-sum game, where a gain in competitiveness from one party must lead to a loss in competitiveness for another. Now, uh, currently, um, our view is that we don't need to settle this debate in the PRA, but we do need to be able to articulate what we think our new secondary objective requires of, that, of us, so that when we assess policy choices that advanced safety and soundness, we can choose those that are more aligned with whatever articulation we have put forward on what a secondary objective means. Now, what we think is that the UK's financial services industry is contributing to growth and international competitiveness when three outcomes are achieved. One, UK financial services firms undertake cross-border activities, thus adding to the level of UK economic activity through an increase in exports, not only directly, but also by facilitating exports of non-financial firms. Two, the UK maintains its current status as a top tier global financial hub, thus not only furthering its competitive advantage, but also attracting foreign capital. And three, UK financial services firms support growth by providing finance to the corporate sector, especially new and innovative firms whose growth potential would otherwise be curtailed because of financial constraints. Now, sadly, and as noted earlier, the PRA cannot claim credit for success when all these three outcomes are achieved, uh, if they're achieved, because as prudential regulators will have little influence over some of the key levers. But we can develop a strategy that can contribute to the achievement of the UK as a whole of these outcomes, while, as I said, and subject to advancing our primary objective of safety and soundness and financial stability. Such a strategy can seek, can seek to do three things when making prudential regulation. One, harness the UK's strengths as a global financial center. Two, maintain trust in the UK as a place to come and do business. And three, tailor regulations to UK circumstances. Taking each of these three things in turn, now, the UK's historical success in financial services has resulted in it being amongst the world's most interconnected financial systems in the world. We host around 150 branches and around 100 subsidiaries of international banks and around 200 branches and subsidiaries, but subsidiaries of international insurers. These include branches and subsidiaries of all the banks identified by the Financial Stability Board as globally systemically important banks and many uh, international active insurers. In order to harness the UK strength in this area, we should provide a high level of what we call in the bank responsible openness. That is, we should be open to overseas financial firms wanting to do business here 
and to global UK firms expanding overseas, but in a responsible and safe way that does not impinge on safety and soundness and financial stability. More specifically, we are open to overseas firms who wish to carry out business in the UK, provided the home authorities adopt international standards and there is a good level of coordination and information sharing between us. This is why we have signed a growing series of MOUs, particularly after our, our exit in the EU, about supervisory coordination and information sharing with other regulators around the world. It also means having clear expectations for firms who want to branch into the UK about the conditions that need to be met before subsidiarization and therefore direct uh, uh, supervision and regulation by the PRA is required. And we do have that. We do have specific policies published. Importantly, it means operating a stable, predictable, and transparent financial <coughs> regulatory regime so that firms know what is required from them currently, what is in the pipeline, and have clear mechanisms to put forward the views. To contribute to this, we have improved the way we communicate and coordinate our regulatory plans. Since 2020, we have been working with six other regulators active in the financial services sphere to produce an aggregate regulatory grid, setting out our plans in one place, our plans over the next two years. And we are developing a new UK rule book that would be easier to navigate than uh, the current one. Positive feedback has been received on both of these initiatives, which suggests that predictability, transparency, and accessibility helps in this sphere, and the feedback has come from the industry. We also do other things to support responsible openness. We support the government's work pursuing free trade agreements with financial services chapters and bespoke mutual recognition agreements that facilitate safe access to overseas markets for UK firms. And we seek to remove unnecessary barriers to being open to global capital and human talent if there's no financial stability or safety and soundness benefit. For example, and a bit controversially, we have just argued, uh, we have just finished consulting on remuneration rules on the removal of the so-called bonus cap. This is because we had argued against it when it was being proposed in the EU and we're still members. And, uh, and the EU, by the way, is the only jurisdiction in the world, to my knowledge, that has uh, such a policy. And the reason we had argued against it is because we thought it would not lead to better risk incentives. Rather, it would result in more fixed pay relative to variable pay, which gives less room for downward adjustments in pay and therefore risk adjustments, which is not a good thing. Now, our analysis and published research uh, suggest that this is exactly what happened in practice, which is the reason we are, uh, are proposing to remove it. To be clear, stable and predictable regulation uh, doesn't mean static regulation. Innovation is one of the UK strengths and one of the most important ways living standards in mature economies, as you know, can increase. For that reason, our rulemaking must incorporate a dynamic digital regulatory agenda that maintains safety without stifling innovation. That is why we published a discussion paper about financial firms application of artificial intelligence last year. And you're going to see more from us about this now that we have received the feedback. And uh, we are also doing a lot of work and are going to be proposing rules soon about issuing and holding uh, digital assets. So uh, responsible openness innovation is the first thing. Uh, the second thing we could do to achieve the outcomes outlined above is to maintain trust in the UK's regulatory re regime. This is because no global financial centre can thrive in the long term if it's vulnerable to repeated regulatory failures and cost costly bouts of financial instability. One way of achieving this is being, and being seen to be, a role model on the implementation of strong international standards, which in itself requires playing a leading role in shaping these standards through engagement with multilateral institutions like the Basel Committee, the FSB, and so on. I'm often told by internationally active firms that it is easier to follow one global rule book instead of having to meet the expense of adapting to a, patch, a patchwork of local standards. It is also one reason why aligning with international standards 
makes Britain an attractive place for international firms to come to do business. At a point, our new secondary <clears throat> objective explicitly recognised so its competitiveness and growth subject to alignment with international standards. That said, faithful implementation of international standards still leaves plenty of scope for national authorities to make decisions about specific rules and about risks not covered by these standards. So I'm going to move on now to explain another way we can contribute to the outcomes I discussed earlier. That's by tailoring rules to UK circumstances. This is something we are working hard at as we speak. We are working alongside the government to implement changes announced in December as part of the Edinburgh reforms. Meanwhile, we have used UK data to propose adjustments to some calibrations in the package of banking rules known as Basel 3.1 the end game of uh, the Basel reforms, which we think um, would be overly conservatively if applied here, but we still think that will uh, um, maintain our uh, largely compliance uh, with the standards. Uh, so that includes rules about um, the capital charges against unrated corporate borrowers, uh, which form a very important sector of the UK economy. We have just finished consulting on those standards. The consultation responses are 2,000 pages long, so there's a lot of interest on those. And uh, uh, we're going through them uh, uh, thoroughly, and uh, we're going to listen to the views and come up uh, with standards that are aligned uh, with Basel, that uh, retain our compliance with Basel so that we are continuing to be a role model and influential in this front but they're also appropriately tailored to our circumstances. And uh, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, we have already done that uh, on an earlier Basel regulatory package that we did with our own powers uh, after uh, Brexit. And we are also taking the same approach to work on our insurance uh, regulatory uh, credential package, which is called Solvency, Solvency Two. This has been, uh, this was a controversial debate last year, and it got a lot of public attention. Um, this, this debate now has been resolved, has been settled, um, and we are now moving on in areas where the government and ourselves, because there was a specific area where we were publicly disagreeing, um, but we have accepted the government's uh, view while being uh, public about why we disagree, um, but the rest of the areas, which are many more, uh, we fully agree about the benefits from simplifying the Solvency II regime uh, to better reflect the needs of the UK. And with the high level policy decisions now clear, we are focused on implementation of delivering detailed proposals for consultation in a number of areas, which look at simplifying, streamlining, maintaining openness, um, encouraging um, uh, more uh, firms to enter the market. Uh, we will co be consulting on these proposals um, at the end of this month. Now, uh, one of the benefits of tailoring rules to UK circumstances is that it helps to facilitate effective competition in the markets we regulate. And um, we already have a secondary objective. Uh, we have had it for some years around competition as opposed to international competitiveness, which is going to be the new one. So we already have quite a bit of experience and a lot of expertise about making and competition. And some of it we think is going to be relevant to our new objective uh, on uh, competitiveness and growth. I don't want to be too simplistic amongst uh, the audience here, but if an efficient market is one that allocates resources to the best use, including by ensuring that there are parts of the economy struggling to access finance, that they should be able to secure, then in general terms, what is good for competition is broadly good for growth. The importance of competition means that we need to act when rules that are proportionate for large terms are not proportionate for small ones. Doing so removes barriers to entry. And that is why we have invested in a regime uh, we consulted on the first part um, earlier this year, which we call strong and simple, and which will apply to small uh, banks. Um, and uh, it's, it's called strong because we don't want to reduce the resilience of the small banking uh, sector and what it is now, 
But now you apply very complex rules to it, designed for the big banks, for the international banks, lots of it designed internationally in Basel that doesn't really look at smaller banks. So we want to simplify it. So uh, this, this is a strategy in terms of the agenda, responsible openness, trust, and tailoring to UK circumstances. So what about um, uh, research? <coughs> now, in its first state of the sector report, government explained that in order to maintain the success of the UK's financial services sector, industry, government, and regulators must continue to work collaboratively and to constructively challenge each other. With this in mind, it is therefore important to understand what metrics are available to improve our understanding of the best means to facilitate the UK's competitiveness and growth, while, as I said, advancing our primary objective, and then be clear about the different roles and responsibilities between industry, government, and regulators in bringing this about. Government is currently consulting on which metrics the PRA and the FCA should publish in relation to the new secondary growth and competitiveness objective. And there was a very lively debate in Parliament about the need for such metrics. To help drive this research agenda forward, the PRA uh, will be holding an international conference on the 19th of September this year to deepen our understanding of the links between potential regulation, international competitiveness and growth, with the intent to suggest appropriate metrics that Parliament can use to judge our performance. In this respect, the PRA is also running a pilot survey to gather perceptions and feedback from external stakeholders on the extent to which the PRA's regulatory framework is advancing uh, this new secondary objective. The survey is available on the PRA web website and I invite you all to complete it. I also hope that many of you here will be able to join us in September and I look forward to working together to understand uh, these important uh, issues. Thanks very much.